All right, so let's get started. Uh, so today, as promised, we will jump into the, uh, I would call it the first one third of the course is uh, just getting familiar with ROS. Uh, as was sort of pointed out in the, in the previous lecture, you know, the brains of our uh, F110 car, and for that matter, any robot uh, is uh, implemented using ROS, and ROS stands for Robot Operating System. So today, you know, the idea is to, to give you like a gentle introduction to ROS, but there are a few announcements. So, so first of all, uh, I would say if, if you are enrolled in the course, you should have received a bunch of different announcements from Piazza. So if you are enrolled and you didn't hear anything from Piazza, you should just let me know after the class or just email me, and I'll make sure that uh, you know you are added to Piazza as well. Uh, and so, so there's already work to do for you before our, we, we meet next uh, on Tuesday next week. Uh, we have posted some very straightforward sort of instructions on both how do you get access to Ubuntu if you don't have it already. Uh, and so, as I said earlier, you know there's two ways to go about it. Uh, one is that, hmm, that's a uh, annoying. The virtual box just made it free. <laughs> okay, I thought it was on my machine. That's okay. So, so, so you know, the there's there's two ways to go about it. One is to use a virtual machine, and based on your host operating system, uh, there's two different ways to go about it. On a PC, uh, I recommend using virtual box, and uh, if you go to this tutorial zero, it gives you basically. Uh, resources to follow if you want to install VirtualBox on Windows, plus some best practices to make it work. So one thing I would encourage you to do is, you know, if, if, you're, if your host operating system has, say, four or let's say it has eight gigs of RAM, then don't allocate more than half to your virtual machine because your host also needs some memory to support the virtual machine. Many uh, uh, sort of a big problem is you allocate too much to your virtual machine and your host then chokes out. Right, so that's uh, keep that in mind when you follow those instructions. Uh, you are free to install uh, Ubuntu 18.04 or 16.04. There is no real preference because both are going to be fine for this first one-third portion. Um, the car uses 16.04, but once again, it shouldn't matter if you have learned ROS using uh, you know the base, uh, the Linux distribution 16 or 18. So that's the first part of the tutorial zero is just get access to Ubuntu. Uh, and if you are comfortable dual booting your machine, you can go ahead and do that. It's faster and you won't run into any sort of virtual machine uh, you know, lagging problems. So once you have Ubuntu, whatever distribution, you know, 16 or 18, uh, the, there's another set of instructions which are literally taken from the ROS wiki. So you don't even need the PDF that we have shared. It's just uh, more concise than all the instructions on the wiki. Uh, but you have to install the ROS corresponding to your Ubuntu distribution. So if you have 1604, the version of ROS you will install is called ROS Kinetic. And that's what the instructions on the website and uh, uh, are for, this tutorial 0B. You know, right here on, on the bottom. And then um, if you have uh, 18.04, you will install a version of ROS called uh, ROS Melodic. Okay, so, so you have to do this so that we can get into the lab sessions of this course as well. So you have VM and you have a dual boot. There is a third option, but use it only for a backup because unlike those first two options, it won't last even the one-third portion of the, the course. You won't be able to do assignments. So that option is there's a, a, a service called ROS Dev Studio, uh, and it's free for a beginner account. And what this is is that you simply can create an instance of 16.04 with Kinetic in the cloud for free and just access it through your browser. So you don't locally install anything, not a virtual machine, not a dual boot or what have you. Uh, the limitation is that may be good for maybe uh, you know lab session or two when we are just getting familiar with the ROS framework. But as soon as we get into writing your own nodes, uh, then it's much, much better to have a local distribution of uh, Ubuntu and ROS. Uh, I do recommend you still create an account because you know, if you face a problem that you're not able to resolve, uh, you shouldn't just sit and listen to the slides during the lab session. Uh, you should follow along with the code during the lab session. So this is good enough for the first few weeks. And yeah, the, I think the beginner account gives you like 30, 40 hours per month free access of this uh, uh, cloud-based instance. 
All right, so, so today uh, we are going to understand what ROS is. I'm going to give you some intuition, uh, followed by you know, some of the basic commands that uh, you all have to know and basically learn. Uh, and so let's get started with that. So you know, previously we saw this idea that a self-driving car has to do uh, quite a bit in order to be able to make any good decisions about driving in the real world. Uh, and so it has to do this perception, planning, and control. And you know, what should be clear at some level is the way we do this is we take data from our suite of sensors on board the hardware. And these could be LiDAR, radar, GPS, cameras, ultrasonic. And then we have to ingest all this data and make sense of the world, which is what the perception uh, sort of problem is. Right? And, and this is all well and good in theory. Let's actually look at some, some real world implementations of this. So here are some pictures from a self-driving car prototype. Uh, and you see it's using many, many different kinds of sensors. The Velodyne stuff is all LiDAR. Uh, LiDARs can be mounted up top, on the front, or the back. Uh, essentially, they give you this 360 holistic view of what is around you. Uh, you have many, many types of cameras. Some are placed sort of behind the wind, uh, windshield. Some are placed on an array on top of the vehicle. Uh, you have GPS or GNSS. GNSS is just ground navigation satellite system, so basically GPS. And it's very, very precise. It can give you uh, maybe decimeter level accuracy, uh, you know, so you know which lane you are in and things like that. And so we have all this real hardware. This is all sending data simultaneously. And so the rate at which it sends data also varies. LIDARs can give millions of point measurements per second. Cameras can give up to 60 or maybe even higher frame, frame rates. And so you have to ingest all this data in real time, not dropping so much information, and also make sense of this and then act in the world. Right, so you need a powerful computer to do that. And this is an example. It's actually dated already. This was, the, say, one of the first uh, embedded systems which was marketed for uh, this very specific task of self-driving from NVIDIA. Um, but now we have you know, successors to this Drive PX2 system, which are much more capable uh, and optimized for very specific tasks. Right, so you have all this hardware you know, the, in, in this particular prototype. Uh, the NVIDIA computer, which is running ROS, basically, or a version of it, was uh, placed in the boot of the vehicle. And it has to be powered using a separate you know, power pack on its own. Uh, and sometimes you have redundancy built in. So if one computer fails, the other can take over. All right, so this is very similar to, in some sense, the setup that I spoke about on Tuesday. Uh, we have a very similar sort of uh, action space where we also need to ingest data from uh, you know, uh, the same sensors, just different types and different specs. And we have to make sense of all that data in real time from multiple sources and then make decisions about racing, which are even harder than, than regular driving. Right, so this is the sort of the task at hand. You have to solve this problem in software in order for your hardware to be anything autonomous. And so to to give you a feel or an intuition for why you would need ROS to solve this problem, I'm going to digress for a bit from self-driving and just speak in general robotic terms. Right? So, so let's try to program a robot, or let's try to reason what it would take to program a robot. And we begin with a thought experiment that we want to program this sort of miniature humanoid robot which can self-balance. So this robot has maybe uh, cameras for eyes. It has definitely some sort of a, a accelerometer, which can tell whether it's tipping over or not. Uh, it has some contact sensors on the feet or on the arms. It has some motors, which have to be actuated for this thing to move around. And so you have this robot. And the task at hand is we want to basically play soccer with this robot. And actually, this task was considered as as a very difficult task uh, and led to this whole you know, RoboCup uh, competition uh, where teams from all over the world, they come and code their teams. Uh, and so you, know, you, you want to like, detect the ball and figure out where you are. You have to pass the ball to your teammates. And when one robot feels there's a good opportunity to score a goal, uh, it has to actually kick the ball into the goal. Right? So it's, it's not an easy task. But let's say our goal is to program this robot, which has the aforementioned sensors, um, set of sensors. So I want to hear from you what, if you were coding literally this robot to play soccer, 
what sort of functions or subroutines would you use, right? So can you decompose the play soccer goal into specific sub goals and, and tie them to specific sensors on the robot? So what are some, some thoughts? Think about it and, and you can raise your hand and, and let me know. How would we go about programming a, a, such a robot to play soccer? So move to a position, so that can map to like a motor command, right? Because the motors have to be kicked in, okay? You had another suggestion? Um, basic walking. Similar, but sure, yeah. Very good, so if you have a swarm or a team, which is a soccer thing, uh, you need to know where other teammates are. Yeah, I saw another hand. Very good. There's no point moving about if you don't know what you have to either receive or pass. Yep. Uh, kick, kick, the ball. kick the ball, right? Very essential activity. Uh, between Correct, right? So, so all of those are really good suggestions. That's how even you know, I would begin thinking about if I had to jot down a pseudocode on, on a whiteboard. Uh, these are things or tasks that the robot has to do. Uh, and you can associate each one of them with a specific sort of sensor command, right? So locating the ball is definitely useful. Uh, uh, the camera is useful for that task. Talking to other teammates, maybe you just need a wireless channel to do that. Or you can even locate teammates with your camera, right? So it's a, it's a design choice. So those are all great suggestions. And, uh, uh, and you know, your code may look something like this. This is what we are used to as CS students working with embedded systems. We write code, which is sort of the sequential code, right? So we have these tasks. We can order the task in some logical format. Don't worry about the specifics of these functions, but they sort of capture the suggestions that you made that we have to locate the ball, maybe move towards the ball, kick the ball to a teammate, and doing all of this, you have to also know where we are on the field, right? So, so there's all these simultaneous tasks that you have to solve, and a typical way you would think about writing this code is this while one loop, and then you have subroutines, with each one of them, you do some compute, read some data, and you return something that the other subroutine can use. Okay, makes sense? This is how we typically go about writing code. So, so what can be problems with this sort of writing? What are, some, what are some limitations of this way of thinking about our soccer playing robot? Yeah. Yeah, so let me repeat what was said. Things don't always work out in the real world. Right? That's the surest thing that you can be sure of. And maybe you are too consumed figuring out where the ball is that you lose track of where you are, and then you're just kicking in the air. Or you'd have no clue where others are because some subroutine didn't do its job. It took a lot of time. It may even you know, crash because just one piece of this chain uh, has crashed. Right? So, so this monolithic sequential uh, uh, way of coding things, it doesn't uh, always work out, and you can see, you know, some 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 examples. This robot is trying to do its best, but yeah, <laughs> right, so so it can fail, and it doesn't fail gracefully. And so the, the real challenge is that there's a challenge of complexity. The complexity challenge is we have all these functions, and they all have to happen in tandem. So what's a good way? of programming or thinking about programming, which doesn't fail like the previous video. There's challenges of concurrency. There's challenges of how to synchronize these data or these activities among each other so that they follow some order, but at the same time, uh, it's, uh, you know, even if something is not behaving properly, all the rest is still functioning well. And in general, in robotics, which is also you know, relevant to our thought experiment, there's a problem of scaling this. You have multiple robots, so how would you you know, scale your code to work with multiple robots very, very easily. And so these are some of the things which we routinely pose a challenge when we design robots. And so essentially, you know, all these challenges are a mess to deal with. Uh, and your code, if it's sequential, will be just this monolith long thousands of lines of code uh, as a executable which can fa uh, fail in unexpected ways and it's also harder to debug. And so this is where ROS's basic capability really shines, right? So ROS, unlike the name implies, is not an operating system. 
but it's a set of libraries, it's a set of tools, it's a set of what are called plumbing tools. Plumbing in the sense that it can do process management, it can communicate different data between these different subroutines or functions better than this monolith way of programming a robot. It provides a lot of tools and you will learn all, most of these tools which are very relevant to the course and to autonomy in general uh, for debugging, gracefully debugging the robot. Um, the biggest advantage perhaps is it provides a set of existing packages. So someone has written a package to do mapping. So you don't have to write your own algorithm to do mapping. You can just pass it data to that package and it'll create the map for you as long as you, know, uh, you are passing it the correct data. So in the ROS view of world, our code will look like this. It's modular and it's parallel in some sense or distributed, right? So each function that we just had dissected from the problem becomes its own executable. It's not a single file which is running everything. Each function is its own what is called a ROS node and the way these things communicate with each other is they pass the relevant data to whosoever needs it. Right? So for example, in this picture, uh, we may need to plan how, have, how we have to kick the ball. So we need to call the position of the ball from a, a ROS node called the soccer ball tracker, which is in turn calling some data from a ROS node uh, which is detecting the soccer ball. So even if there's a delay or something goes wrong in that detection, other things are still functioning because these are linked to each other only through who requests what data from whom, right? So, 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 so what this can lead you to is if other things are not functioning, at least you know, you're, you're not critically failing. So there you go. Okay, something kicked in at the very last second. So this is one of the biggest reasons why roboticists love ROS. And this is, you know, the difference is apparent in these images. We don't want to write monolithic code. So essentially, ROS embraces this idea of distributed peer-to-peer -peer execution. So don't mistake this, by the way, that, you know, um, these are all different nodes which are running on separate robots. This is running on the single robot, but the functionality is getting executed in this modular fashion. It is, however, possible, and that's sort of this you know, red point over here, uh, it is possible that this distributed execution can be across physically different hardware. That's allowed in ROS, and we will see actually an example of that deeper into the, uh, into the course. Right, so it's distributed peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, I won't read all of what is written here, but uh, maybe the, another good point is it's multilingual. So Python, C++, Java, uh, they are readily supported in ROS, and each of them has their own API. So whatever developers are comfortable with, you know, they can still sort of uh, develop their robot. Okay, so let's quickly look at how we got here. So this is not a history lesson, but um, I like to provide context to why things exist and not just, you know, here's something that you can use. Uh, so we got here uh, after almost like a decade of research. These are some of the seminal robots which really made ROS very uh, powerful and useful. Um, so if you are into robotics, you may recognize some of them. If not, let me start from the uh, top left. Uh, that's called the PR2 from a company called Willow Garage. Uh, the one next to it, uh, the red one is called Baxter. It's essentially a manipulator and used a lot in industrial manufacturing and assembly. Uh, this one is called a TurtleBot. It's another ROS learning platform. The one on the bottom left is called Robonaut or R2 from NASA. It's actually deployed on the International Space Station. So, you know, ROS has left the planet. And then uh, we have on the bottom right a uh, robot called Husky. It's a ground vehicle uh, by a company called ClearPath, right? So these were sort of the initial robots which uh, demonstrated that, you know, these uh, complicated tasks can be done in this modular uh, fashion. And we didn't stop here. Many, many robots, largely, you know, uh, anything you would find in an Amazon warehouse, uh, uh, or in retail in general or in logistics, and you already know self-driving cars, uh, they use something similar to ROS. Maybe all of them don't use ROS. They use commercial uh, OS, which are um, embracing the same modular functionality uh, as ROS. And ROS also allows you, as would be apparent when you install it, to actually choose just the functionality that you need. Right? Sometimes you don't need the entire Photoshop 
500 features, you just need six Instagram filters, right? So Ross gives you that flexibility that, you know, you can uh, uh, basically throw the kitchen sink at something and it'll consume a lot of power, but for something low power, it can even, you know, work with the uh, uh, less than sort of uh, uh, one watt over there and occasionally sleep and then wake up and do its uh, task. So this development of ROS has happened over the last decade largely, uh, but it started way, way uh, before that. Uh, so this came out of a project at Stanford called Stair, that robot is shown uh, in the image here. But then this company called Willow Garage, which makes the PR2, uh, they essentially became the entity which uh, kept this project alive and had the idea of uh, making it open source so that everybody could uh, contribute to it. So I think it was in 2007 when the first version of ROS was released for everybody to use, and then it just took off from there. Uh, many, many versions have been released since then. Um, and the organization which maintains ROS today largely is called the, uh, uh, the Open Robotics uh, Foundation, right? So, so they are the ones who uh, make sure that whatever distribution of ROS you download uh, is not going to crash and the packages are updated anytime another version of an OS is released. Okay, a little bit more context. So ROS is released in distributions. Um, just like you know, Android follows the English alphabet when they release their distribution, the same is true for ROS. So the ROS Kinetic, which uh, you know, the car uses, was released in 2016. Um, it's a long-term support distribution. I think it, it, it will be supported until the summer of 2021. So, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about uh, upgrading uh, at least for another year and a half. Uh, and the uh, Ross Melodic was released in 2018. Uh, I think the next distribution is scheduled to be released in the summer of, uh, of this year. Right, so that it follows this alphabet. And you may notice something weird that every... Uh, sort of, you know, the uh, uh, icon of this distribution has some turtle associated with it. And also, actually, you know, they are, the turtles keep changing from every distribution to the other. So uh, I'm not going to tell you why that is, but at the end of the lecture, you'll know why, why ROS is associated with these turtles. So today, the Open Source Robotics Foundation maintains this, uh, but they are not the only entity. It is also... Uh, very heavily maintained by academics like ourselves uh, and folks from the industry. A lot of people in the industry uh, use ROS, right? So, uh, and they contribute in many, many ways. The ROS.org wiki is perhaps the biggest one-stop shop for anything to do with ROS. Uh, you know, you can go and look at any package and it will tell you the person who's responsible for maintaining that package. So you can, uh, you know, open an issue just like you do on Git. Uh, and let them know if something is not working. Uh, you can also see when was the last time something was updated, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, another way that the community keeps up with newer developments, there's an annual conference called ROSCON, ROS Conference. Uh, this slide is old. It has been going on uh, beyond 2017 as well. Um, in fact, uh, you know, uh, if you want, you can skip your next Netflix episode of The Witcher and instead watch your TA present at Roscon for, you know, 50 minutes. So he was there last year. And, you know, just to show you the scale of this, uh, every year in Roscon, they acknowledge everybody who com sort of contributed to Ross. And so this is one of the slides from a few years ago. These are all the people who contributed commits to uh, this open source big, is one of the biggest open source projects, I would say, which is so much widely used. Uh, but this is not the only slide. There's like two or three more of these, right? So the list is very, very large. I would say, however, you might read about it or come across, there is something called ROS2, okay? So, but we are not going to use ROS2 in this course. In fact, it makes best sense that we learn everything in ROS first and implement it on the car. And I assure you that before the course has ended, uh, I will dedicate you know, one lecture on telling you about what ROS2 is and why you should be concerned with that, if especially you are considering going into uh, you know, some sort of an industry or academic career path which requires you to work with robotics and uh, autonomy. 
And so talking about that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's very apparent that if you do want to pursue, you know, anything related to autonomy or robotics or especially with self-driving cars from a control perspective or even if, you know, uh, there are many, many people who know deep learning and they can, you know, train a vehicle to recognize some uh, traffic sign or things like that, but you are essentially um, becoming a part of a much more exclusive Venn diagram if you also speak ROS, in addition to uh, being uh, proficient at all these uh, CS-related skills. And again, this is not just my opinion. Real companies use uh, this OS all the time. Okay, so, so that's enough about sort of the background and the why this exists. So let's jump into how it works, okay? And that's sort of the, uh, all of what we will use the remainder of today's lecture for. Uh, and so once again, if you have questions at any time uh, as we get into these different functions, just let me know. All right, so the, we, we've seen this picture before. One of the biggest reasons we want to use ROS is they are existing packages that we can just leverage without having to write code from scratch. And it gets us to our end goal much, much sooner than if you had to you know, program everything from uh, the bottom up. Uh, so we'll definitely use a lot of packages. Some of them are shown here. Uh, so if it's, the text is not visible, the perception packages are basically some packages written to fetch data from the LiDAR, from the camera, for the IMU. The planning part is how do you map, how do you localize in the map with that particle filter stuff. And then the control is that PID controller uh, that I showed you uh, in Tuesday's lecture. All right, so we have packages, we have lots of different tools. Uh, one very popular tool is called Gazebo. So Gazebo is a simulator. Uh, and actually, when you download the desktop full installation of ROS, uh, the Gazebo is also downloaded uh, as part of that uh, sort of distribution. Uh, and what this allows you to do is essentially, as you can imagine, in any simulator, we can have virtual sensors in some uh, environment. You can even import environments from Unreal or Unity or whatever 3D uh, CAD program you prefer. And, and then your robot can uh, get virtual data and you can you know, basically do your entire uh, dev cycle within the simulator itself. So the simulator I showed you again in the previous lecture uh, for the F110 is also built using Gazebo. Then there's a visualization tool that you will use. It's called RViz. So ROS visualization short RViz. Uh, this is like a Fitbit for your robot, right? So it will give you real time uh, visualization of what your robot is doing, uh, what maps are you building, what data is being fetched, who is talking to whom, uh, everything and anything there is to know you can visualize in RViz. There's been development, like I said, uh, there's something called WebViz as well where some people have essentially used the Java API of ROS to implement RViz-like platforms in the web. These are used all the time in real industry in self-driving cars. This is the example actually from Cruise Automation, one of the, um, the players in the autonomous vehicles, uh, and they use WebViz for all their dev and visualization, all the cool videos that they use in their marketing as well. Uh, another tool we will use is called RQT Graph. So how many of you have heard about QT, the graphic? Okay, so uh, some of you have. So QT is just like a graphical uh, editor slash uh, graphical API to make uh, essentially uh, GUIs or graphical user interfaces. So RQT is just ROS QT, right? So, so RQT Graph is a, is a tool, uh, and what it does, it may look very intimidating, but uh, this is showing you all the different nodes which run on the F110 car, right? So remember these modular things on our uh, thought experiment? So this is for real. So this is not a thought experiment anymore. These are the different modular executables running on the car, and I have sort of overlaid what is doing what in terms of this perception planning control. So right now, this may seem like, well, you could basically write anything and connect an arrow, but it will all make sense once we understand the the nitty-gritty of how the car works. So once again, you know, I always draw parallels between what we do and the real world. So this is very similar to how that prototype I showed in the very beginning is also programmed. Right? So we don't have to deal with all of the detail in this picture, but the high-level view is everything in orange is meant to be the inbuilt capability of the car. Right? So when you buy a sedan or whatever, Toyota, uh, 
it comes with some torque sensors, some brake sensors. So you don't need to you know, go to that low level to add your own sensors. And if you don't know this, all these sensors, they talk to each other using a protocol called CAN, or Control Area Network. So that's standard for all vehicles. And everything in blue is what ROS is doing. Okay, so ROS can also talk to the scan bus, therefore it can fetch data from the innate sensors, plus at the very top, it can also fetch data from all the external sensors that we have put in place for this car to be self-driving. And AutoWare is actually an open source project built on ROS that if you buy a Lincoln MKZ and you buy the recommended set of sensors and uh, pay someone or do this over a DIY month to put it together in the car, you can literally just create an image of AutoWare and it will give you the perception, planning and control um, uh, execution and source code for that car to become autonomous. And it's being used quite a lot in research and development. Yes. It's fully legal. It's road legal. Real companies are using it. AutoWare is very vetted. It's not a weekend project by some hackathon. It's uh, you know backed by real companies. So this is a very serious uh, uh, implementation. And in fact, I would say one of the most realistic open source implementations. Yeah. And the question of legality in general for autonomous vehicles is something we'll also touch as a meta theme in this in this course. Okay, more upsells on ROS, okay? I'm trying to convince you why ROS is good. So AutoWare, we love ROS because uh, we don't even need that Lincoln M MKZ, right? So someone who has the prototype can drive around and ROS provides very, very important functionality called ROS bag, that second sort of the uh, icon in this uh, uh, flow diagram. So ROS bag allows you to replay real data. So you don't even need gazebo, you don't need a real car. Someone has done a trip around Charlottesville and collected LiDAR camera data, logged it using ROS bag, and you can replay a ROS bag as if the car is now driving again, right? So it's this deja vu world that you can tweak and operate and try different um, uh, accuracies of different algorithms. So AutoWare also supports that. In fact, if you, I think, go to AutoWare.io or something like that, uh, it will give you real ROS bags, which are gigabit, like GB's worth of uh, real world data. Okay, so let's actually uh, get into the weeds a little bit of how ROS handles this modular uh, inter-process stuff, right? Because it seems very convincing why it would make the, why it, we should be using this modular architecture. What is not clear is how do we actually you know, implement it, right? So, so this is, again, a high-level view of different functionalities that a self-driving car has to do. So if we zoom in into localization for a bit, um, you know, uh, it may look something like that RQT image I just showed you a second ago. So again, we don't have to understand, but if you're curious, what I can see by looking at this, you have something called a point localizer which is getting data from the LiDAR, right? So all this LiDAR data is being sent to the node called a point localizer. Uh, that node is also getting data from like the GPS. It's getting data from some IMU. Um, it's also getting data from some previous map that you may have stored. And then it is outputting some topic called current pose. So all of this assembly is just doing one task of figuring out the pose of the car, the autoware car. Pose is in another uh, a fancy word for saying what is your position in XYZ and what is your orientation. So those four things are commonly called pose. Right, so we have all these different functionalities. They have to exchange relevant data, and that's what you have to care about as a ROS designer. You don't have to care about writing this monolithic loop. And the way this is possible is using the canonical unit of ROS called a ROS node. Okay, each of these executables, I've already been calling them nodes just to you know, uh, give you a seed into your brains. So the ROS node is that executable that can run independently. So in this picture, you have a camera node, which is just getting data. Then it sends that data to maybe some image processing node to some other soccer ball node, motion planning node. So the question arises, well, okay, it makes sense to write, let's say, functions as different nodes, but who is ensuring that you know, these nodes are speaking to each other in the correct manner, the timing is correct, and all that interesting stuff? And so the answer there is the green stuff on the top. Every ROS execution 
there is always a node present which you don't have to write, and that node is called ROS master. And the job of ROS master is to manage the communication with all the other nodes. So here's your very first ROS command that we will practice in the lab session. Right now, I'm just going to go over them. The very first thing you always do when you begin anything to do with ROS is you run a command called ROS core. ROS core will launch what is called the master, but in the background. And actually, you can see when you run ROS core in the terminal, it will say that the ROS master is running successfully. So when ROS code is launched, then this master, which is essentially the, the manager of all the nodes, um, it will take care of any other nodes which are then initialized. It will take care of who this node has to talk to and how that data exchange is going to take place. Okay, so we have the ROS node, and then we have the master, and then we can launch these nodes. When I say launch these nodes, I'm essentially saying, you know, there's a, going to be a command to run these nodes. You will see that. Actually, it's right here, not even in a bit. So to run a node, you say ROS run, the name of the package to which this node belongs. I haven't defined what a package is, but I'll define it in just a second. And you just follow it by the name of the node you want to run. So for example, I want to run the node which gets the data from the LiDAR. I will say ROS run, name of the package where this node resides. And let's say the node's name is uh, you know, get LiDAR data. And that's a Python file. So you're essentially asking ROS to execute that file. Yes? In the finished car, will all the nodes be running on the car itself? So, okay. So the question was do all the nodes at the, uh, on the F110 reside on the Jetson on the F110? Um, the answer is no, it does not. And I'll tell you why. Like I said, so these two nodes, they don't have to be on a physical machine, but they can talk to the same master. So what can happen is the car runs, let's say, the core autonomous racing code, but your remote machine or your laptop can run the visualization part, right? Because we can't have a long HDMI cable connected to the car as it's running about. So it's, it's going to te uh, use telemetry for another node, which is registered to the same master as the car, but on your machine. Okay, so it doesn't have to be the same machine. Yeah. Is this why virtualization is kind of hard for the past? Well, it is twofold. One is I want everyone to learn ROS, so you need Ubuntu for that, or preferred Ubuntu. Um, uh, so I don't want to digress too much, but ROS2 can actually run on OS X and Windows natively, right? So while it's two thumbs up to that and you don't have to deal with virtual machines, uh, for this course, we need Ubuntu. Uh, so virtualization is just the least resistive path towards that. Uh, like I said, we are exploring these cloud platforms of ROS as well. So, uh, you know, future iterations of this course might not require the, the VM, but this year we need a VM. So follow the tutorials, yeah. Yes, yes, we'll talk about that, yeah. So, you know, we have already on this page, you can see two commands, and right now you don't need to remember these. I'm just, again, introducing them. Uh, in fact, one thing you will know in this first one-third of the course, I will keep repeating some key concepts until you get sick and tired of hearing me say those things, but that's sort of what it takes to get accustomed to these new terms, okay? So we have ROS run, and we can use a package name, node name. Uh, we have a command called ROS node, which essentially has a set of sub functionalities that allow you to interact with nodes, right? So uh, no points for guessing that ROS node list would just list all the nodes and there are many, many other ROS node commands as well. Okay, so now how do these nodes talk to each other, right? That's also one of the key uh, ingredients of a good ROS implementation. So here's more terminology that you have to get used to. So nodes communicate with each other on dedicated channels which are called topics in ROS. Okay, so, so in this picture, you have a LiDAR, and the name of the LiDAR is called Hokuyo Node. Hokuyo is the manufacturer of that LiDAR, and Hokuyo Node is a ROS package that someone has maintained and uh, kept alive. And so this Hokuyo Node may be publishing some data or sending some data to another node which wants the LiDAR to build a map. And so it does so on a dedicated channel called scan. Okay, so Communication in ROS occurs over topics, and topics are nothing but dedicated channels. 
Another thing, as I've said before, the communication model, there are many models in ROS. The one that you have to worry about the most is this publisher-subscriber model. So if you are a ROS node, you can publish any topic you want. In this case, you are publishing scan as the topic. And actually, you don't care who subscribes to that topic. It's the ROS master who ensures that if someone has requested subscription to a topic which is being published by some other node, then that communication channel is established in a timely manner and packets are exchanged. So the publisher doesn't worry about what the subscriber is doing. It is the ROS master which is choreographing this exchange of data. And this exchange of data is occurring on dedicated channels called topics in ROS. Okay, and I'll repeat this, so, so uh, then I'll pause for some questions. Okay, so back to our sort of simplified view. You have node one, which is a publisher. Node two is a subscriber. So node one is publishing on some topic. We don't care what in this diagram. And node two is subscribed. You can see there's this floating arrow which says that there can be many, many subscribers. That's allowed. Right, because uh, as I said before, the publisher doesn't care who subscribes, so it does also doesn't care how many subscribers there are. And all of this exchange is facilitated, again, by the ROS master. So just like we had a dedicated command to interact with nodes called ROS nodes, so it's very intuitive, you have a dedicated command to interact with topics called ROS topics. Okay, so not rocket science, very easy to sort of make sense of. So you have similar commands, ROS topic list, ROS topic show, uh, things like that. And you'll see examples of that shortly. So when two nodes are exchanging information over topics, one can now ask, what is it exactly that is getting exchanged? And that data which is getting published on a topic is called a message, a ROS message. So again, in our LiDAR view, our Hokuyo node is publishing a topic called scan in the black. But the type of message it sends every time over that channel is a data structure called laser scan. This is just an example. Don't worry about these fields right now. So what are messages? They're nothing but data structures. So you may have a data structure for exchanging the pose of a robot. I can imagine that the relevant fields in that data structure would be X, Y, Z, and angular position. And then you may publish that message called you know, uh, pose on a channel called localization. And someone else can subscribe and know where the robot is. OK, so let me repeat. Messages are just data structures, which are packets in some sense that, you know, this is what your node is actually doing. It's doing its compute, packaging everything into some message data structure, and publishing, publishing that data structure on some topic, and whosoever is interested can subscribe to that topic. Questions? It will become clear once you also get into the habit of doing this in the lab. Okay, so back to this view. The topic, what has been shown is decomposed into messages. And so every uh, you know, execution has this dot message file. Uh, again, don't worry about file structure. That's a dedicated lecture. But we have a dedicated file called dot msg. And that file tells me the data structure, which will comprise one packet or one message. And a sequence of messages is uh, what is being sent on the topic. All right, so let's cover the rest of it. Um, so once again, it's echoed. The nodes communicate messages in topics. And this picture is just to make the point that a single publisher can have as many subscribers. So it, the publisher is not, by the way, sending different messages to different subscribers. It is just sending its own message, whatever the Python script is telling it to do, on this topic called scan, which is the name of the topic. The type of message is laser scan. Uh, and subscribers like mapping node or some monitor uh, are just using that repeated information. Mostly primitives. 
but you can have some logical and arithmetic constructs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what is a package, right? I said to execute a node, you say ROS run, package name, node name. Package is nothing but like a composition of multiple nodes and multiple messages. And don't worry about services. We'll touch them shortly uh, in one of the labs. But you can have many, many nodes. So you know, every node, uh, let's say you want a package like we saw earlier to get the pose of the autonomous autoware car. And it had a bunch of nodes. The LiDAR node, the IMU node, the GPU, uh, GPS node, the mapping node. So you can collectively call all of this the localization package. That's what package is. It's just a logical construct of a collection of things that, as a designer of the robot, you want to collectively you know, view them as uh, having some common function or some, any common message type. So this is what the RQT graph also was trying to show us. Right? So this is what is the computational graph. Don't worry about all this text. Maybe this picture is what is needed. So you have a ROS master, which ROS master is actually connected to every node. And you'll see how in just a second. But in this simplified view, we don't actually consider ROS master as part of the native nodes because it's always there. But all these other nodes of LiDAR, mapping, localization, planning, they are exchanging topics with each other, whatever is relevant for your code to execute. And also notice, all of them don't even have to be in the same language. Some nodes can be in C++, some can be in ROS Pi, some can be in Java, some can be on different hardware. But as long as they are registered to the same master and you as a designer are ensuring that the relevant published things are getting subscribed to by the relevant nodes, your robot will save the goal. Yes? There is, right? So, so um, other than, let's say, the language which is easier, relatively speaking, Python is much easier to understand the code and everything. Um, sometimes you care about latency. You care that it shouldn't take me you know, uh, uh, two seconds to process if uh, there's a stop sign or not. So when you care about latency, you may go to low-level languages like C++ or even C. Uh, and computer vision, generally, the nodes are written in C++. Uh, but it's, it's very modular, yeah. Good, good question, right? So, so who is ensuring the order in which stuff is happening? So let's answer that here. All right, so once again, I know this is the first time you'll be thinking how many times is this guy going to repeat this, but this is not the last. So topics are streaming data. We are publishing the topics, and there's this virtual sort of link called the registration with the master. Publishing is sometimes also called advertising, same thing, just semantics. So you publish on a topic. One of the things I haven't mentioned so far, so I'm glad this slide exists, uh, on the command line, one way to figure out that this particular thing is a topic or a message is that most topics, they, uh, they always have this um, uh, forward slash uh, which precedes them, the name of the topic. So on that topic, the multiple messages, the, all these messages have the same data structure, not the same content, just the same data structure. And then you have subscribers which are listening for this topic. And so the question was, what about ordering and, you know, if we are published, three, if I'm subscribed to four things, then how do I make sure that, you know, I receive them in the correct order and so on and so forth? So messages by design are asynchronous. What does that mean? It means three things. So firstly, publishers are not cognizant of who is listening by design. That actually means if you're not careful, messages can be dropped. And subscribers are mostly event triggered. What does that mean? That in my subscriber, I will declare, you will see that when we get to the code part of things, I will declare that I'm interested in subscribing to a topic. And then I will have a callback that anytime a new message is published on the topic, that callback is invoked as a subscriber. But 
ROS master, using ROS master, I can declare a buffer. I can declare the rate at which something is getting published. So indirectly, we can control for ordering and sequencing of messages, but innately, messages are what are called asynchronous. So there is no clockwork that something got published and immediately something happens. There may be you know, other things that have to be required to be done, and these things can be logically taken into account into your callback functions. That, okay, I did get something from the camera, but you know what? I'm not going to give my estimate of the pose unless I also get something from the LiDAR. You can do that in the callback. So I hope that answers your, uh, your question. Okay, so different topics can use the same message type. Okay, again, this is allowed. Uh, so you have two cameras, both are publishing on different topics. So camera one RGB, camera two RGB are different channels or different topics, but they are using the same data structure called image. In fact, they are both even publishing to the maybe the same subscriber. So why is this useful? I've said this before, you have many, many cameras. You may want to know what does my dashboard camera view, what does my center, left, left right camera view. In fact, if you know, don't know this, Tesla uses like eight cameras. Right? So I'm not saying they use ROS, but they definitely use similar constructs. Another thing we've already covered, you can have you know, one too many publication. Uh, so the same message is broadcasted to whoever is interested in subscribing. Okay, so one last time, let me tell you the role of ROS master, and then you know, uh, I think I might even be able to show you how this works on my virtual machine. So let's say in a, in a toy example, we simply have two nodes, camera and viewer. So what you would do is you would first run ROS core. And in the background, the ROS master would automatically be uh, executed. Very, very important. If for whatever reason, the ROS master crashes, everything will stop working. I hope that was sort of you know, uh, obvious, but let me make sure. You know, sometimes you may accidentally control C a wrong terminal and wonder what happened to your execution. It's, you may want to go back and check if the master is alive. So we have two. Um, nodes, let's say they are both in Python or whatever, C++. So camera wants to publish or advertise a topic called images in the code. So this information is automatically sent to the ROS master, which keeps track of what are all the topics which are currently getting published by whichever nodes. So that's where the ROS topic list also comes from. Then there would be a subscriber subscribe to images just for viewing them or you know, running some advanced algorithm. So that knowledge or that actual command is first sent to the master without you know, any uh, developer uh, sort of uh, interruption. It just happens on its own. And so the master will check, do I have this topic in my list of current topics? And if so, it will open a virtual TCP socket. And then, so don't worry about if you don't know what TCP sockets are, this is what the virtual channel is. And this is what the role of the master is. So every node is registering with the master, letting it know what it is publishing, what it is subscribing. It doesn't have to let the master know what computation it is doing, that's the node's business. But the master will then facilitate this virtual socket between the publisher and subscriber. So you may have, you know, then, then you can actually publish packets of the type IMG on this topic called images. And if you have another viewer who also wants to subscribe to images, the master will just open uh, a new topic and so on and so forth. All right, so, so So we don't need to bother yet how this works. Um, it may become relevant when things don't work, OK? But I, I won't, don't want to go into that right now. OK, so let's just quickly do a recap of some of, yeah, sorry. Um, on the public channels, is there an ordering guarantee or There is no ordering guarantee. The ordering guarantee is the burden on the node. 
that it ha if it requires some ordering of th different subscriptions, it has to parse them in its own callback smartly. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a like a causal relationship that you know when something is published, there is a buffer, and so you know if you are publishing faster than what the subscriber can process, you, there's a size of a buffer. Things will get stacked on the buffer, um, but if you are not able to process them at a good enough speed, things may also get dropped. There, there is no guarantee, and it is routine for actually messages to get dropped. Yeah, even on real cars, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so quick recap of some of the commands that we will use to get familiar with ROS. The very first thing is ROS core. What you need to remember is nothing works without ROS core. Okay, so if a ROS core is not working, red flags. Okay, ROS core starts up the master. Then we need a command to actually start running our nodes. That command is called ROS run. The syntax is ROS run, name of the package, followed by the name of the node. This is probably not the best example because the package name and the name is identical, but that's not always the case. But for the LIDAR, we say ROS run Hokuyo node, Hokuyo node, and we'll start publishing on a topic called scan, messages of type laser scan. Things to interact with the node are using the command ROS node, very intuitive. Similarly, to interact with topics, the command to remember is ROS topic, and I will show you, uh, you know, a, a quick glimpse of how this works in just a second. Uh, one of the things I want to just show you, I think this is also a little bit dated, but because ROS Java is very well supported now, um, but ROS has these client libraries, right? So uh, I said earlier that it doesn't matter which node is written in which programming language. Well, it does matter that it has to be one programming language. You can't switch you know, between uh, programming languages on the same node. But, uh, so we have APIs in ROS. We have a ROS CPP, ROS Py, ROS Java, uh, predominantly for almost like 80, 90% of this course, you only need ROS Py. But if in your projects you want to do vision stuff, then uh, the language of choice is ROS CPP. Uh, and, and what this API supports, don't worry about all this, uh, slide and text, it supports all these features, right? So, uh, so one, might, one might question, how do you actually initialize a piece of code to be a ROS node? There's a command called init node that tells uh, ROS master that this Python executable is a node, right? There's a command called .publisher .subscriber, which will tell the master what the intent of this node is, okay? So we have a little bit of time, so don't get too excited. I want to actually show you some stuff. Okay, so I'm using parallels on my, on my OS X. And so the first thing we will do is say raw score. I hope this is visible. Uh, but I'm actually also recording this lecture just to try it out to see, you know, if I can make it available even offline. So when we run raw score, a bunch of things happen. Um, the important things is here it shows me that indeed my Ubuntu distribution, oh sorry, my ROS distribution is connect, and this is 16.04. Uh, it also tells me that you know a process called master was started. Uh, this is something we'll get to later. Uh, and it's actually also starting another process called ROS out, which I didn't talk about. But the, the reason we have ROS out is that it's the universal data logger, which is built in. It's going to keep track of what was launched for how long, when it was launched, what crashed, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is ROS core. Uh, let's actually run a node and to get you a feel of you know, how things work. So let me open another terminal instance and I'm going to type ROS run name of the package, the name of the package is turtle sim. So this is your first clue on why we like turtles. And then the name of the node is turtle sim node. And when I run this, it opens up an ocean with the simulated turtle. And that's the obsession of ROS with turtles. Every distribution has its own turtle. 
and we will use Turtle Sim to actually learn about ROS. Okay, so let me show you a little bit, um, just in the next maybe five, 10 minutes, and then we are done. So let me first make sure this is always on top. So I have two active Windows sessions already. Let me open another terminal instance. And uh, I'm going to be clever and make some space. So here on the bottom terminal, I'm going to launch another node because I want to interact with this robot or turtle. And this is ROS run. Package name is again uh, turtle sim. By the way, I, I'm not even typing the entire thing. I hit, I write turtle and hit tab and ROS automatically can find the package. And then I want to start a node called turtle teleop key. Teleop key is short for teleoperation using the keyboard. So when I run this, it says use the arrow keys as long as this is the active session of the shell to move the turtle. So I'm actively now pressing the arrows on my keyboard and you can see that this node is communicating with another ROS node, okay? So we have two nodes now. Can we convince ourselves how they are exchanging information with each other? So let me open yet another terminal and this time, I'll keep it on the top half. So here I'm going to show you ROS run. Name of the package is RQT graph and the node name is actually also RQT graph. So this is the visualization of what is happening. We have turtle sim, which is this ocean, which is a ROS node. We have another ROS node, which is our teleop ROS node. Turtle one is the instantiation of this turtle. Uh, and this is the topic on which my keyboard commands were being sent to the subscriber. Pretty cool. Or all out of the box. I didn't have to do anything. In fact, let's take a different view of the same problem, right? So I quit the RQT graph. Let me quickly clear this terminal. And I will first show you ROS node list. So we have ROS out, which is by default the logger that we never worry about unless things crash. But we have two nodes, what we expect. One is called turtle sim and the other is teleop turtle, same as the RQD graph. I can keep going, I can say ROS topic list. So once again, these are the default ones that we don't worry about, but there's actually more topics. The one that we just saw was command velocity, but there's other topics as well that I, uh, you know, didn't appear in the RQT graph and I'll, you'll understand why uh, when we do the lab session. So now let me keep going. I will say, you know, okay, I shouldn't have erased it, but let's do this again. So uh, ROS topic list, these are all the topics. I want to actually see who is publishing and who is subscribing to any topic in this list. So for any ROS command in general, you can type the command, so ROS topic, and just type help, and it will show you all the different options that can follow that command. All right, so you don't need to go to ROS wiki for everything. So the option I'm interested in is info. So now I can clear it and say ROS topic info, and the name of the topic is total one command velocity. And when I hit return, it tells me that this is a topic which is published by my teleoperation, right? So command velocity is getting published by the keyboard, by this node. And who is subscribing? The ocean simulator is subscribing, which is also shown that the subscribers are backslash turtleson. Okay, so here, you know, it's easy to, for you to see which topics are published and subscribed by whom. And so final thing for the day, yes, there's a question. So yes, there is a local host, but it will become relevant. When I showed you ROS code, there was this ROS master URI. So that has something to do with that. So uh, maybe uh, not the correct answer, but the short answer is don't worry about it right now, okay? All right, so uh, the last thing I wanna show you is we've interacted with a topic, we have seen nodes, 
we've seen the RQT visualization, which helps, you know, in this case, it's obvious there are two nodes, there's no other option, but you can see when you have many, many things, RQT is a very useful tool for a sanity check that correct topics are getting published, yeah. That's the last thing I wanted to show. So I'm glad you brought it up. So let's actually see what is getting sent when I press an arrow. So I can now say Ross topic echo. So I want to echo all the messages from the topic command velocity. So right now there are no messages to display because I ha I'm not pressing any arrow keys. But when I make my teleop instance active and start issuing messages, you can see how a linear and an angular message is being sent. Every time I push something, you know, a linear look x, x is equal to two, then there will be an angular change and I can, you know, keep going. In fact, a better topic to visualize, and I promise this is really the last thing. Oh, I accidentally killed my tally up. Right, so remember that we had actually more topics than just the command velocity. This is what we just visualized. But there's a topic called pose, and I already sort of give you a feeler for what pose is. So why don't we look at this topic, right? We can say Ross topic echo and the name of the topic. Again, I don't have to type the entire thing, pose. So this is telling me exactly where the turtle is right now the x, y coordinates of the position of the turtle and the angular position in radians. And so now if I go back and try to move this, you can see the pose is changing in real time. So if you had your own custom node, and this can be a homework exercise, that any time the turtle is near some radius around 5,5, 5, which is the middle of the ocean, you have to, uh, you know, uh, echo some message that, you know, uh, I'm free or whatever. And so to do that, your node is going to have to subscribe to this point to be able to figure out where is the total. And you're going to do something actually very similar in one of your um, assignments. So, so any questions about the basic constructs? In the lab session next week, we will build upon this elementary sort of machinery to uh, get to the point eventually where you can write your own nodes or your own publishers and your own subscribers. And I can promise you today, one of your labs is to autonomously control this turtle. And if you can autonomously make the turtle swim, you can autonomously make anything drive. As simple as that. It's an oversimplification, but it is true. Okay, so yeah, one last question perhaps, yeah. So, okay, so the question is regarding what is going on with the... So, this is an example out of box from Ross. So, the reason why, you know, it's not, the topic is not just pose and command velocity, there's a turtle one prefix, is because you can have multiple turtles. So you can have dedicated topics to control dedicated turtles. Yeah. What does it refer to as though? I mean, the turtle is like, is it referred to an object or? Yeah, it's, the, it's this. It's just called an object, right? It's, I'm trying to learn the, the I So in this simulator almost, or in this visualization, an uh, object would be appropriate. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions? All right, so uh, I will see you next week. Please make sure that you explore one out of three or four possibilities and have access to ROS. Otherwise, uh, it will not be worth your time, okay? So I'll see you next week.